You are just back. You just this week, the what, two days ago, day before yesterday or yesterday? You were yesterday, down in Shelton. We were in Shelton. Okay. Yeah. So, and that is something that you do regularly. You travel to. Different. Yes. Yeah. But the, you know what? Um, so you we, you've been where we do what I call dog and pony shows in the prisons, where you might have a hundred to three hundred prisoners, and we might have six, eight, ten staff or guests, and and people from Google and the University of Washington. Once we even had Anna Marie Cousy in one of the prisons at Monroe, but but this yesterday uh, has been a lot like our more recent. Um, trips into prison and it's where and it's it, it comes out of the fact where we chose in 2010 to focus on people who are high risk to recidivate according to the Department of Corrections and um, and, and the DOC really does I say this over and over again they do a really abysmal job I think of of mental health ratings but they do an excellent job of risking uh, of rating you whether you're low chance to recidivate high risk to recidivate moderate risk to the point that if i was a prisoner in washington and they had rated me as high violent high non-violent high property whatever high anything i'd be worried because, because they're pretty accurate with it so we um so anyway, we're dealing with people. We're we're working with people uh, who are most often high risk to recidivate. They're always high risk to recidivate. We won't work with somebody. We won't spend money on somebody who's not high risk to recidivate, and um, and most often also seriously mentally ill, and. Um, and so when they're close to the door and about to release, um, we may have met them six months ago or a year ago, but we want to touch base and just make sure all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed and we know what they've got on their mind and they know what our rules and limitations are and what to expect from us. And, and so um, there was one yesterday we saw two guys yesterday we and and, and uh kudos to dan white who's the superintendent at at the washington correction center um and his staff so we on short notice really short notice um i asked dan to let us come in yesterday to meet with these two men and it was like, boom, boom, boom. And so somebody was standing at the door when Taylor and I showed up yesterday morning at 8.30, a, a, a navigator. Uh, uh, really pretty cool, too. Uh, Kimberly married a former student of ours who's finishing a master's degree now, Eddie Parnell. So it's uh, in some, some weird exotic degree that I, microbiology, something or another, and um, but so Kimberly was right at the door, um, and we went back to education, and they had the first guy on call out for nine, and the second guy on call out for ten, and then Dan's administrative assistant Yvonne. I wanted Taylor had not been in that prison before, and I wanted her to have a tour uh, of that prison because it's it's mail intake, and 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 everybody goes through it, and we get a lot of calls and applications from there so uh, Yvonne took the time to walk Taylor all over those hundred acres and so but the the deal was one guy um, I'm glad you asked this because I, I instead of doing the whole show about really negative pessimistic stuff which we'll get to I wanted to I want I was like to think of something really upbeat and so um, I'll I'll, I'll I didn't even have this on my mind, but this is this was a really cool experience. So we had a, a, a we worked really closely with a guy who works at Google headquarters, um, Avi Shai, and um, 
last year, and he's he's a certified life coach. So aside from being way high up in Google for cloud operations, he's a, a certified life coach, and and he really really believes in life coaching and uh, its effectiveness, and so do I. Uh, and he called me up maybe September, October last year. And he said, I've got, I've, on my calendar, I've got myself checked out for Thanksgiving week. So Google knows I'm not available. My, all of my people that report to me worldwide know I'm not available. And, and he said, I'm thinking about instead of planning, uh, spending Thanksgiving week with my family, I'm thinking about spending Thanksgiving week with prisoners, which is not something I hear every day. And, um, and so he basically said, set up whatever you want. And the idea was to talk to prisoners for our first time ever about life coaching. So we were like totally, totally winging it. So I, um, I really wanted him to go into one of the women's prisons because I think they're super sad, and especially the prison at Belfair, because there's so much trauma. And I, wa- I wanted, I wanted Avi to see that. Um, but they were the the superintendent at Belfair was totally non-reactive, which was disappointing. Um, so I we ended up four prisons in two days um, at Washington State Penitentiary and Coyote Ridge, and um, Avi flew in from Palo Alto and. And two of us met him at the Seattle airport, and then we flew down to Tri Cities, um, and <coughs> and then, excuse me, and then uh, <coughs> the first more <coughs> the first day we were in Coyote Ridge in the medium and in the camp, and the second day we were in Washington State Penitentiary in the East Complex, in the West Complex, and we go in. And uh, this leads up to one of the guys that we met with yesterday. So we go in, uh, and we've got no plan. We've got we've got Google people development outlines that are important points that should be uh, stressed in a life coaching situation. Um, and some some things that I really love now that I'm talking about it, I wish I had it with me. But uh, um, but we're just totally winging it. So the the first so what we did is we told the prisoners we're winging it. We're like we've never we've never brought life coaching into the prisons before. Um, we don't know what's going to happen two minutes from now. We you know it's just going to pop out of somebody's mouth. But so I talked about how we got involved with life coaching. The post prison education program got involved, which was years ago through a woman named Sarah Carr, who's at Google in the people development department at Kirkland, um, and something of an angel, and um, and 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 how Googlers have life coached students of ours for three years. Um, and, um, and then we talked a minute or two about post-prison education program, but we pretty much stayed away from all that traditional post-secondary talk and kept it with life coaching and what it is. And then the two of us from post-prison education program stepped away, introduced Avi. I had told everybody how I met him and, and then he took over, and he and so he he asked. He did something I would have never done. He 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 asked guys for a volunteer, you know, so uh, to do a demo, uh, like a mock life coaching session. So maybe a, a typical life coaching session will last an hour, and it could be Google Hangouts, or it could be face to face, or 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 whatever, or. Uh, but they were, he wanted to do a 15 minute demo just so people could get a real deal. And so, you know, in, in a prison setting and, and way more so in a male prison than a female, 
I thought nobody is going to volunteer to do this and get up and re- and talk about things they're really worried about that are deeply personal. It's just you just don't do that in a in a high security bail prison. You just don't. But four prisons in a row, four guys in a row had the courage to do it. And so this guy, um, a guy volunteered, and it was spectacular. It, it, and, and it was it was really moving. It was incredible. To watch Avi and this prisoner um, relate and move through real life coaching questions, it was super cool. And um, so we did that twice at Coyote Ridge, and and again, to volunteers at both places, and they both really opened up. And then the next morning, we're at the Washington State Penitentiary, and I think we were in the East Complex first. And we met the guy who Taylor and I met with yesterday at Shelton. And um, um, and that group was close to 80 or 100 guys in the visit room. And, um, and it was a group preparing for release. So it was a group that DOC had, had authorized an outside entity to come in and uh, prepare these guys for for successful release, and again we had a volunteer, and I'm not I don't think he would mind me naming him, but I'm I'm not going to. But um, and the guys had lost a third of his brain to a tumor, and I and you can track back. And in fact, so I was sitting behind him when he and Avi were doing the mock session, and you could see the scar uh, way, start way above his ear and coming way down below his ear where the surgery had been, where this tumor was removed. And I, you know, and I think he had had been having seizures, which played into his criminal cases and scared people, and. Um, and weren't even understood by family. So like his, his, this is where profanity really should be allowed, but I won't, but it's like his parents got a 99 year, uh, no contact order against their son because they're so dis, uh, uh, what an empathic, not sympathetic, not understanding ignoramuses. I don't even know. I can't imagine ever getting going to court to get a 99 year no contact order against my son or daughter and just like inconceivable so anyway he had lost a third of his brain and he's back in prison not for the first time and he's his original erd uh, release date was march 3rd and then it then it changed to we're not sure when uh, because of victim notifications, and then it ought, and then as of yesterday, it's April seventh. But when we went down there, we thought he would be releasing this month, um, and and to Bellingham. And I hadn't seen him since last Thanksgiving week, and I just wanted to touch all the bases and and introduce him to Taylor, and um, so that was one person we met with, and you know he's super anxious and he's super focused um and, and so that so that what so that was that was why we went down so he's got like medical issues he, and and addiction issues and 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 disadvantages from having lost a third of his brain due to a tumor and um and then the other guy i didn't realize i had met him it, uh, uh, multiple times in multiple prisons, but it's, uh, but we had three applications from this guy dating back to 2013 and we had never worked for him never. So, and it's cause he very quickly went back after, you know, he would come out and bang right back in prison with new cases. And, uh, and so all, he's getting close to the door, and when men and women get close to the door, they get 
freaked out, scared. Uh, they might not be scared to walk into a bank with a gun in hand and rob a bank or to get in a brawl or, a, or, or, or whatever. Uh, but when you, but facing release into nothingness, which is happening all the time, um, they're scared of that and I don't blame them. And, and so, so we've got three applications stacked up from this guy. Uh, he's been in prison most of his life, multiple times. And I'm the name's not ringing a bell. Right. And even when I saw him, when he came in, when they brought him into education on the call out, I didn't recognize him, but he started the conversation with that, you know, like, all right, it's been a long time. And he started talking about us having seen him at Aberdeen and having seen him at Coyote Ridge. And, and then we, you know, so, but we, we just wanted to find out what he was, what this guy who was applying three times, but we never see, cause he always goes back instantly what he was about. And, and, and did we want to honor all this frenzy of letter writing and stuff by uh, deciding to go to work for him or not, but we just had to find out what, what it was about. And, um, and so we did that and that was, we were really impressed with, I was already impressed with, with the first guy with, you know, and, and from the life coaching session, but this guy, we were like Taylor and I were both super impressed with this guy. And, um, and so then we stopped, we stopped in Olympia and to see Keith Whiteman, cause this guy is going to release to Olympia. And, uh, and so I want to plug Keith into that. And, and we ended up at Wagner's, um, I wanted to go there cause I love their key lime pie and they were out. And then I wanted cherry pie, but they didn't have any individual pieces. So I had to get an entire cherry pie. <laughs> so, but anyway, Keith was there and, and, you know, Keith was, is working for, um, Catholic community services, a guy with 40 felony convictions and many six imprisonments. And he's graduated Evergreen state college and he's working for, uh, he's fat and happy and, and, bought a home in Tacoma and he's, and, and he's, he's working for a pro a Olympia police department program called familiar faces, which, you know, the, but I wanted, I wanted Taylor to meet Keith. And then the woman that he, um, this was cool. The woman that he sort of interfaces with, if not works with, I mean, if you knew, if you've known Keith, like since 2008, as I have, it's really surprising to be having lunch with him and, and, and a police officer at the table. But so Ann Larson is like the outreach services coordinator for the Olympia police department. And she was there and, um, and she's wonderful. And, and, uh, but so, so we set Keith up for an August release for this guy coming to, you know, coming to Olympia and, had cherry pie and whatever else we did and um and then fought traffic back to seattle so that was that was yesterday and um and it was a good day so the uh and i, I just want to say one last thing about the life coaching sessions that we did last november it was i ended up being more moved by what I saw in those four prisons with these guys as, 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 as Avi talked to them about life coaching and watching him work with prisoners, um, than anything in 15 years. I mean, I, I literally, when we were flying back from Tri cities, we had to come back to Seattle and, and, and then, and then he may have left Tri cities and headed straight back to California. I don't remember his flight, but, but it, but, on the way back, I'm like thinking, I was really like, I need to go down to, to Tumwater and, and talk to Steve Sinclair about getting life coaching into the prisons. It would benefit the Department of Corrections. It would benefit prisoners. It would benefit their prison, their families. But it was just like a super emotional, almost spiritual. You know, I'm about as spiritual as a rock, right? Or a rattlesnake, but, but, but like it was almost maybe more a rattlesnake, but yeah, <laughs> shake, shake your head. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> and, but it was, a re it was really amazing to watch these guys work with Avi in these mock 
sessions at these four prisons. Um, and we, and, and, and as a result, at a time when we've, we've never been more poorly funded than we are now, we're underwater. The, the bad part of that uh, trip was that every time we go into the prison, there's so much hopelessness and so much fear and that, that we just get bombed with applications. So, so like I pulled back ever since Doris Buffett, you know, went down the tubes uh, with dementia, I've really pulled back on our dog and pony shows and almost don't do them. And, uh, and we still get 10, 12 applications a day, but this trip in these four prisons in two days, we maybe got a hundred applications. So, so we're working really closely with a bunch of people that we met in these life coaching sessions. And, uh, but it was, it was a soup. It was like a spiritual thing to see. And, and the guys found it to be meaningful. I mean, really meaningful. And they got it. They got, they caught on, they got it and they could, they could work with it. I mean, so that was, um, that was the good part of, I mean, that was yesterday. So, Mm -hmm. Um, there's a, that's a, uh, 22 minute answer to your very short question. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I, <clears throat> I remember at the time you were, you had mixed feelings about that, um, that those visits. I was, I was a little dismayed or a lot dismayed. I was actually, I think I was on the way to Israel for holiday and maybe won't hear this but i'll put it on facebook and he will but i was really i knew what would happen i knew we would get flooded with applications and i and and i think it's a crime or it should be a crime to to deliver false hope to prisoners uh and uh so i was i was worried i was worried about that i uh and I was dismayed that we were doing it. And if, if anybody other than him had asked me to do it, I'd have probably like, you know, hell no, double hell no, F you, go jump in the lake. It's not happening. We're not doing it. And, um, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm glad we did it because it, it ended up being almost spiritual. It was incredible. And, and, um, You know, it's it's really something. Um, it's really something that the DOC should look at. I mean, they're doing. You know, I I want to talk about a bill that has now passed the House and Senate, and I guess will be signed into law. And I think it's a bad bill, but um, the legislature is putting money behind so many stupid things and passing so much bad legislation, which they've done all nonstop since I moved to Washington uh, 20 years ago. Um, it'd be nice to see the legislature and the, and the Department of Corrections create a program that would be presumably low cost, um, that would be just super effective and benefit prisoners and family and DOC staff, because it would make the prisons be safer places, because people would be thinking differently than otherwise. You know, I used to, um, 300 years ago when Eldon Vale was secretary of the DOC, um, there was some pushback at, at the, at the Washington state reformatory at Monroe, one of the five prisons at Monroe about a university beyond bars and college programs being offered to even people doing life, right? and or almost especially people doing life and eldon was savvy enough and it was just so obvious that that, that the, the, the 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 line the line staff who were haters and uh, you know really um didn't get it but you if you're if you're a guard or any staff member in a prison do you want prisoners walking around thinking of themselves as a student or do you want them walking around the prison thinking of themselves as a convict, right? And, and you know, and this all this macho, you know, I'm a gangster, I'm a convict, you know, or or walking around thinking that there's a student. So with life coaching, 
you want people walking around thinking really positively. And I, I, you know, I remember one of the key points that I really liked, uh, love, of, of, uh, and I won't get this exactly right, but one of the life coaching questions that you, you would ask somebody is um, along the lines of, like, what could you do? You know, with, 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 when you release with your life or after you've released with your life, what could you do? What are you capable of? And then the next, and, 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 and they need to think that through. And maybe it's be an astronaut or a neurosurgeon or, you know, we just, last show we talked about Max Willard. I'm loving Max Willard's Facebook page. He's, you know, he graduated Divers Institute of Technology and he's just doing spectacularly well and all these pictures are he's out on the water and he's in dry suits and smiling and clean and sober and just having a blast it's just like what, what could you do be an iron worker be a a, a, a nurse whatever and, but then the next question is what will you do and, the, and so you juxtapot you, you, what you're capable of versus what you'll really actually realize and, and those are powerful questions and so um Anyway, that's something that I think DOC should seriously look into, and and uh, and perhaps yeah. maybe the the legislators too when they're proposing bills. Maybe what could yeah. you do with some of these bills versus what are you going to do? You know, the, so I got a call. You know, like with with everybody, uh, there's. Good, cor- you know, it, it, with corporations, except for maybe FedEx delivery people, they're all good people, right? Uh, but, but, but in, in, in all, on all job sites, there's, there's horrible people, and then there's middle of the road people, and then there's just exemplary people who are amazing. And so, over the last 15 years, we've run into CCOs, probation officers who are haters. I mean, like, you're like, you're like, oh, my God, this former prisoner is going to be on this person's caseload. How can I fix this, get them moved, change, it, change the catchment area, because this person's a disaster. I mean, a real hater. I mean, they really think prisoners are all scum and da da da, da. And then you get these middle-of-the-road people that aren't going to help beyond the rules and regulations, but they're also not going to hurt and they're not going to be like spitefully mean. They pretty much want to go to work and, and go home and be safe and get their paycheck and have do their job according to the rules. But, and then you get these spectacular people that, that, that are partner. They've become partners of ours. We really, we, we rely on CCOs, right? And so I got a call from one of those yesterday. And uh, because we're working together on, we have a mutual client, right? And uh, we work closely with this woman and uh, as we have with many CCOs. And, uh, and we, I don't know what I, I think she said, I think somehow the, we, we got on the subject of swift and certain. And then she started talking about Roger Goodman, one of the three bills that, that Roger Goodman's run through public safety, uh, terminates swift and certain, which was just legislated not too many years ago. And, and I think swift and certain is a real, and I'll explain what it is, but I think it's a really important it's just, it's super important. And, and so, so what, you know, what you get is you get this fancy pants lawyer. It's, it's amazing to me that Roger Goodman and I were ever friends. I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm feeling like the dumbest guy on earth. Like I've got less brains than God gave a crowbar that I didn't see through this bum, you know? So he's, he's this fancy pants, Harvard educated lawyer who's at the legislature, he told me he's at the legislature to stay in the House to stay, not running for the Senate because he, he's comfortable where he is, and it's, it's guaranteed security. You know, he's got, he's got a job. 
and all he has to do is win re-election every couple of years in a, in a in a district where he's popular. And so, I mean, we sat in his fancy pants office in the ledge building, and I mean, he was on my first board of directors. I have known him before the post prison education program started. He's just a fancy pants Harvard guy, white guy from Kirkland, the east side of you know. And 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 the point is, he doesn't he hasn't experienced anything that the prisoners who he's legislating about have lived and experienced day in and day out. So who, who advised him that killing Swift and Certain was a good idea? I don't know, but I guarantee you it was somebody that didn't really understand how Swift and Certain works. And, and that's not even the bill I want to fuss about. So, but the Swift and Certain, just so you know, is... Um, the, the, and the CCOs hated this originally. When it passed several years ago, there was an uproar because it took discretion away from them, right? And so if somebody failed a urine test or missed an appointment or was late for an appointment, this legislation mandated that they be locked up for like three days. So you, you get them off the streets swiftly and, and for certain. And the, and the, and the discretion to not put them in the jail was taken away from the CCOs. So, you know, that's, that can interfere with the argument is that that interferes with jobs. Um, so if somebody's didn't, maybe they didn't relapse. They're not using drugs. You know, they're not liable to be doing what I call running and gunning and catch new charges very fast. Um, uh, maybe they had a plausible excuse or maybe they just didn't plan right or the bus caught on fire or whatever, but it's not like they've relapsed and they're running and gunning. There's some people that fit that category. But for those people who, and you know, I mentioned Keith Whiteman a minute ago. I'm going to, you know, like, so 27 minutes ago. So I always think, how the heck are we going to fill an hour? And then we always like run out of time, but it's, you know, Keith, came out in 2008 and uh, did really well at Pierce College in, in, at Fort Steelacombe campus. Really well. Um, and then he either, I, I don't know whether you fall in sex or you fall in love or if you're really lucky, maybe both, but you know, but anyway, he got in a relationship that, and, um, and, and then he relapsed. And so, and we tried, we, we moved him out of Pierce County to Kirkland and moved him from Pierce College to Bellevue College and did everything we could to, to get him away from the drug scene in Pierce County. And we were unsuccessful because he was in a relationship that he just felt he couldn't live without. But the point is, one day, this police officer calls me from Gig Harbor, and and somehow he knew that we had been involved with in Keith's life, and and he he wanted to know where he was, and could I could I could I reach him, and uh, and the long and the and the, the the police officer, I was spent two hours on the phone. This, we'd never had that kind of a call before. I spent two hours on the phone with this guy. And, you know, he'd been in Keith's Facebook page. He knew everything. He knew where, you know, he's like, Wh whose motorcycle is that? Whose motorhome is that? You know, where, wh whose house is that? And, and I'm having to, like, look at Keith's Facebook page to see what the heck he's talking about and all that. But so then when I, the deal was he had, this is the point, he had charges, felony charges from Port Orchard to Moses Lake, which is not a short drive, five counties. He had enough charges to put himself to put him away for like 20 years, right? If they were all prosecuted separately, county by county, and the police officer from Gig Harbor was like, "If you'll, if you if you can get him to come in, I'll work with you, and I'm sure I can pull this off. Work with you and him to uh, to uh, get everything consolidated, and maybe he'll do four years." And so I talked to Kim Gordon, Kimberly Gordon at Gordon and Saunders to see if she'd be willing to go to wherever Keith was and help 
and be with us when we go turn him in. And then I called a former student of ours who's a, a close friend of Keith's going back a million years. And, and I'm like, where do you, and I knew the girl he was with and so, and she, and they were cousins. So I'm like, how, how do I get Christina's what's the number? And I call and I, and, and I'm like, you know, I need to talk to Keith. You know where he's at. She handed him the phone, right? And but the point, the point was, you know, so and then the the, the, the it's not ha ha funny, but it's so typical. It's ironically funny. It's like as fast as I told him that we've been contacted by the police department, and they wanted him to turn himself in, and and he said he said let me call you right back. And of course, I didn't hear from him again, and and we didn't see him again until we he was being sentenced in the Pierce County court, you know, and, and it brought in out of the jail, right. Where he'd been sitting for six or eight months. But the point is he relapsed and very quickly running and gunning had felony charges from Port Orchard to Moses Lake. And he got a 120 month dosis sentence out of that. So he did close to five years in DOC, which is now costing more than $40,000 a year. So whatever the hell Roger Goodman and and the Inslee staff is thinking about when they kill Swift and certain, I don't know, but they obviously, they don't know what's happening out in the field. They really don't. So like, um, and so CCOs are concerned about Swift and certain having been killed. (coughs) And I know it's a mistake. I mean, it it just, it's a mistake. It, it, It literally, and I'm going to get off this, but when, <coughs> you know, when I started this program in 2005, if one of our students had an infraction levied against them, they caught it and got violated. I was ready to like hire the Marine Corps to go shoot this, the probation officer or, or whatever. I thought it was the worst thing in the world that it happened. And over the years, I learned that it's probably the best thing. If somebody has relapsed, getting them in the jail will could save their life and it can sure save them five or 10 years in prison or two years in prison or eight years in prison or worse. You know, when somebody is loaded on meth or whatever, and they're running and gunning, I mean, once meth takes over your brain, you're in trouble. I mean, you can't even talk to that person anymore. You're talking to the drug and I can't even explain it's bad. You know, we're at the, hopefully I can say ass, we're at the ass end of a mess right now with a student who previously has done very well. And, uh, it's once she relapsed, uh, you know, there was no, there's no stopping because you're not, you, you can be sitting with them at a Starbucks where you, where they agree, despite their paranoia to sit down and talk to you, but you're not even talking to that person. You're talking to the drug and, 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 and it's taken over their brain. So, so like versus like Keith, uh, and, 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 uh, and ended up with 120 month dose of sentence, which costs state taxpayers a bundle of money. Swift and certain gets them off the street into the jail where hopefully it's mostly clean and sober and, and, and they, and that crap can clear out of their brain and their brain starts working again. And then in the in six or seven days, you can start planning on rebuilding. So, you know, so Goodman's just successfully killed Swift and certain and, and not just him, but ever all of his marble palace cronies down there. I mean, I think we ought to get like, I ought to call Tim Harris up and we ought to run some kind of a referendum or something where we, where we have the electorate decide to tear down the legislative campus in Olympia and sell it to Marriott resorts and send the legislators home to take all the money from that sale and use it wisely for programs. Right. So anyway, but the so they b- just killed that bill. Um, they just killed that program in this session. This yeah. It just, session? yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I was, yeah, they did. And, and, you know, and some of my friends, like Melody Simley, uh, uh, love that it's been killed. And, but sh- she's, she's looking where somebody isn't on drugs. You know, they would be locked up in the jail 
for some non-relapse reason. And if you segregate those, so like if you got swift and certain for people that have relapsed and, and don't have swift and certain, and that, so that all goes back to discretion with the CCOs. So it's like, um, so anyway, so, so it's swift and certain isn't always called for and it's all not always needed, but boy, when it is needed, it can save somebody's life. It can save, it, it, you know, it, it, period, end, end of story. But the, the one that the call, the, the main part of the call I had, I think, yesterday morning or the, the day before was Goodman Prime, this bill that you printed out for me. It's House Bill 2394. It has now passed the Senate and passed the, the, the uh, House. And it's an act relating to community custody. And uh, the CCOs, and I totally am ignorant of this, and I want to emphasize this. I don't know if the union for the corrections officers is correct or not. I don't know if Steve Sinclair and Roger Goodman, who seem to be like sleeping together, loving this bill, enamored with this bill working together to make it pass uh or right um uh, but but the deal is the ccos believe that it's going to result in maybe 200 fewer ccos in the state and what what it does is it takes basically a three-year probation sentence and reduces it to a one-year probation sentence and there's and so, so my concern, where I do know a lot, is this MAT program that 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 Inslee ordered several years ago. That's that's putting millions of dollars of Suboxone in the prisons and millions of dollars of Suboxone in the communities. And and I so I know um, I know what that's doing. And we're we're acting on that, right? In, in fact, I've got a meeting with uh, Marla Zink and some others. We've got a, a defense attorney. We've got a meeting with Satterberg Monday, I think it is the tenth. But um, and w we've met with Seattle Times, and we're and you've been involved in some of these discussions. I know what's going on with Matt. There's a whistleblower within DOC that's given us everything plus. Disability Rights Washington is now filing Public Records Act requests. I know what's going on with Matt, and it's it's there. It's pharmaceutically induced relapses, and it's taking non-addicts and turning them into addicts. And maybe worst of all, it's taking prisoners and releasing them addicted to Suboxone with a two-day supply of Suboxone, right? Or prescriptions that they can sell on the street. It's just it, you know, or sell in the prisons. It's just the biggest disaster I've seen or been upset about in 15 years. So, so if, if the CCOs are right and House Bill 2394 is going to result in, in that workforce being de reduced by 200 or even 150 or 190 or whatever, a significant number of CCOs at a time when Inslee has prisoners coming out into our communities loaded on suboxone that's just an unmitigated disaster it's it, it, you know it's uh period so um that i don't know um uh, i think that's what happened when i got the call from this we we're talking about this you know the cco client our student and I said something about Matt, and I think that's how we ended up talking about this this bill twenty three ninety four. But um, I, I I don't even know it's a calamity. I don't even know how to describe it. At a time where you need more CCOs than ever to be reduced in, due to Matt, uh, medically assisted treatment they call, is what that stands for. Um, for them to cut that workforce by 200 people or 150 or any significant amount is insane. And, and that really leads to the point 
that I wanted to talk about. So if, if listeners want to like, well, there's that crazy guy on the post-prison education program that's always fussing and complaining, right? If you want to double check what I say, double check Roger Goodman promoting 2394 on Q13 the other day. Um, want to double check CCOs, go to the data, go to the data. And so, you know, I've got all these friends that, that have spent the, the legislative session down in Olympia working with the Jeannie Darnells and the Roger Goodmans of, of the legislature trying to get stuff like parole reestablished, right? And they're down there because they believe in legislators or, or they're hopeful that they can make something good happen. Um, and I tell them every chance I get, like it's a waste of time, you know? So, so, so in reference to the data, when I started this program in 2005, recidivism was 28%. At, th at that time, the legislature's research arm, Washington State Institute for Public Policy and DOC were measuring data different. I mean, recidivism differently. So one was using a five year time frame and one was using three. And then it was quite a few years. So you get what a really high number was some, with, with whichever entity was using the five year and a really low number. And you had, you had all this, like, like in Olympia, they can't even talk the same language, you know. It's like, really? So, like, WISP's doing one thing, DOC's doing another. They're both reporting different ways. It's confusing everybody. But, but it was recidiv three-year recidivism was 28%. And so in 2006, the next year, the SSB 6308 Reentry Task Force met for nine months, started in January, and I was on all four working committees, and it ran until just before Thanksgiving when the final report went to Gregoire, Governor Gregoire. And, and that, that, that task force purpose was to reduce recidivism. It's done, recidivism has done nothing since 2005 but grow and increase. So if you, if you want to, when you hear the Jeannie Darnells and the Tim Ormsby's and, the, and over in Inslee's office, the Sonia Hallams, and all these, I, you said I could say goddamn, right? All these goddamn people who somehow have conned the public into believing that they're smart and that they know what they're doing. If you want to know, look at their report card. Just recidivism now is 33.5%. It has never gone down. So there's, Satterberg had a task force on reducing recidivism. And um, the legislature had that year-long task force on reducing recidivism. And it's just done nothing but climb. Just climb and climb and climb. It's never gone down. It just keeps increasing. And now they're going to reduce, according to the CCO that called me, they're going to this House Bill 2394 is going to reduce the workforce that's out in the communities trying to uh, help, you know, but they both are trying to help people get their lives together and they're also beating them over the head. It's, you know, you know it's like do whatever they can to stop, to have, to have, not have more crime. So if that's put somebody in the jail, if it's violate somebody, if it's fine money for housing, um, if it's get them into treatment, you know, the good CCOs are amazing and, and, uh, and they'll do all those things if they, they it, it, and so, so we've got, so anyways, so just look at the data, you know, you can go to the DOC's website and, and go to the research section and you can look at their quarterly fact cards, which go back, they're archived historically, and you can go all the way back. To, to 2005 when it was 28%. And then you can look at the current quarterly fact card and recidivism is 33.5%. And that's, that's the legislature's report card. And they're failing. You know, they are failing. And, and if, the reason I emailed you earlier and asked you if I could say dumb effing stupid was this bill. 
if this bill 2394 is really going to reduce the cco workforce significantly at a time when Inslee has millions of dollars of suboxone being distributed in the prisons and and, and in the communities um that's just dumb effing stupid i can't there's no words words don't work to describe that you know and it's so like Another another measuring stick, and then I'll tell you a Karen Fraser anecdote, and then we'll barely beat nine minutes to go. But like, um, at a point, it was comical when when DOC's recidivism rate, rate kept going up. So, and then Pew Research started talking about readmission instead of recidivism. So the DOC thought they could switch to Pew Research language. And, and get this negative reporting off their website. So they start talk, they put took recidivism off their website, right? And and if you looked at their quarterly fact card, all of a sudden it's talking about readmission, which is return to prison. It's the same definition, but it's not time barred. So it's a return to prison felony conviction uh, during your lifetime. In 2011, the re- readmission rate was around 42%. And um, I remember Bernie Warner, secretary of the DOC, and the second worst secretary the DOC's ever had, Harold Clark gets that crown. And um, Sandy Mullins was his policy person. Sandy asked me to speak to this DOC leadership group uh, at some convening at, at headquarters down in, Tumwater, and um, about a month before I went down to talk to all these higher up people or whatever, um, I had been at a hearing in front of Roger Goodman's committee and as a proponent for post-secondary education. And I knew Bernie Warner was going to be there, so I had color copies of their most recent fact card. And we handed, I had co-workers of mine hand those out to the audience to the media as well as the committee members and the staff members right and it had it had readmission at 48 percent which just fyi is two points away from 50 percent right and 50 percent is half of everybody who comes out is going back that's insane when it and so when, when i'm like I'm headed down to this meeting that Sandy wants me to talk at, and I'm going to print out these, the fact card where it shows the 48% and it's gone. And, 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 and so when I get down to this headquarters kind of a meeting and I'm at the head of the table with Sandy and I looked over at her and I said, Bernie, had you take that off your website, right? Because I embarrassed him at, at the legislature the other day by handing it out. And she, in front of everybody, she admitted it. She admitted that Bernie had her take it down. So, but 42% in 2011, by 2012, it had crossed 50% and was hitting 53%. That's the legislature's report card. That's Gregoire's report card. That's Jay Inslee's report card. They're failing and, 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 and acting like they're doing this wonderful stuff. I mean, if you, have, if you look at Roger Goodman portraying Roger Goodman to the public on Q13 or wherever, you think he's some kind of brilliant hero. He's a He's got less, you know, he, he, first of all, he just a, doesn't give a damn except for the paycheck. That's what he cares about. And everything else is bullshit. But, but just go to the data. I'm sorry. Go to the data. And, 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 uh, and, 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 and let that be your determinant, right? Go to the data. So recidivism, 28%. Now it's 33.5%. Uh, since 2012, readmission rate has consistently been over 50%. More than half the people that come out are going back. And I'll tell you, um, I worked for Karen Fraser in, in, at, the, at the Senate back 100 years ago or so. And she was, in, she was one of the five women that were, that were in leadership, you know, that 
met with Lisa Brown at seven o'clock every morning to decide the future of the world. And, uh, and so I had a relationship with her as a result of that. When readmission hit 48% and Eldon Vale had proposed a plan that would reduce DOC's budget by another 15 million, but reduce recidivism and get funding to nonprofits that know what they're doing. I met with Karen up here. She lives in West Olympia, but I met with her up here. I think the Starbucks at U village and, and, uh, and I showed her this 48% readmission thing, color copy, right? And I'm asking her to support Eldon's recommendation um, that would take money away from the DOC, basically repurpose it to nonprofits that can that can do a better job. And and she and Karen says, "Well, what do I tell the CCOs?" And I said, "Just hand on this fat card, Karen." Hand in the fat card. This is their, this is their overall report card. Almost half of the people that come out are 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 are, are going back, you know. And so, so so it's just like, go to the data. I don't know any other. It, there's just that's just the most important thing. I mean, it's it's go to the data. What <clears throat> what is the uh, the reason they're saying for um, getting rid of? so many ccos is it just a money saving you know that's what when when the cco called me the other day that's i said it's all money you know it's i think Inslee and 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 these millions of dollars of of purchases of suboxone it's baffling to me this the the government has become a drug dealer right only their customers don't even have to pay um but it's all about money. You know, there's so much money changing hands. I mean, of that original $21 million in the MAP program, I don't know how much of that was payroll and how much of it was buying drugs from pharmaceutical companies. Uh, and we're going to find out. We, you know, we filed a public records act request. We'll find out. Uh, but, uh, it's money. It's huge, huge, big money. And, and, and so, this is about budgets. So Sinclair is a huge backer of this bill, 2394. And pro- maybe he's the guy that got Goodman to run the bill. But, you know, who, who knows? I don't know. I don't care. I just care that the bill was brought up. And, uh, but it's, it's got to be about money. And, and, and the point is, you know, I've been really good. we got two minutes. I just put perfect. When I've seen something that I'm so concerned about that I'll, like, write a blast email to half the legislature and, 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 and DOC higher ups. And, and I'll make a prediction. Like if you don't get this guy into treatment, this is what's going to happen. You know, he's going to end up back in prison at whatever, you know, 40,000 a year, whatever. It always comes true. I mean, I was in an argument with Sinclair and his staff, uh, a couple of years ago and some bean counter at DOC headquarters was like, no, we can't send this guy to Pioneer Center North where it will cost 5000 a month. we got to send him to ABH where it will only cost us $2,500. i am like, American Behavioral never works. Never, 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 never works. In 15 years, I've never seen it work for anybody, not once. And I've seen people be routed through there four or five times, right? So, But I'm like, if you, send, if you don't send him to Pioneer Center North, you send in American Behavioral, it's not going to work. And the guy's in the Washington State Penitentiary right now. So what I'm telling everybody right now is just write down that recidivism is 33.5%. If they reduce the, the, the workforce of CCOs simultaneous to flooding every place with Suboxone, you're going to just see that skyrocket. And I hope I live long enough to, to remind everybody of, of, of what Goodman has done with this. EOD, end of discussion. Well, we're out of time, but, well, you'll be back in a month. Yep. All right.